Okay, good morning. So continuing on the concert theme and uh, non-coding drivers. Uh, so we are fundamentally interested in mutations. Uh, so both in mutations as a tool, uh, as two previous speakers described very well, finding functional elements, concert drivers, finding uh, markers, and also in mutations as, as a process fundamentally. And we're working with two different types of data. So now we have germline mutations and somatic mutations in cancer uh, he, uh, <coughs> with the idea that we have genomes of parents and children or control cell and the cancer cell um, uh, samples. And we sequence the DNA and we interpret differences as sequence changes. Um, we interpret sequence changes between the two as de novo mutations. So these are fundamentally the data. Uh, and there are multiple reasons to uh, study this data. Uh, one is statistical genetics of cancer, so using it in, in applied fashion, and this is where I'm going to focus uh, for purpose of this talk. Uh, we're also thinking about evolution and in two different flavors, right? One is mutation rate is a very important parameter in evolutionary studies. So <clears throat> any type of in evolutionary inference depends on mutation rate. Also mutation rate, um, has a very important place in theory, and because it's controlled by uh, DNA replication uh, efficiency, by uh, fidelity of replication process, by efficiency of DNA repair, it's a selectable phenotype, and it, it has a very special place in evolutionary theory, and we're interested in evolution of mutation rate itself. We're also interested in learning about biology of both DNA repair and DNA replication, looking through sequencing data. So this is another, another reason we're interested. So we're interested for, for many different reasons. Uh, but for today's talk, I'll be talking mostly about statistical genetics uh, inference. And I'll start with a very simple statement that the problem is very complex because most of, we uh, of what we know about gene mapping and detection of natural selection is not applicable to our situation, right? So one second you think about what methods you know for gene mapping and for detection of natural selection, and you would think that, oh, we have linkage, statistical linkage, we have statistical association, we have whole toolkit um, of statistical genetics. The problem is that all of these methods fundamentally rely on recombination. Right? They are only applicable to sexual systems. They are not applicable to asexual systems. Same story uh, about methods to detect selection because what cancer genomics does uh, in, in, in its applied wing is trying to find cancer drivers, trying to infer regions of functional elements, non-coding elements now under selection, uh, not, not mutational hotspots. Uh, and most methods available in the field, like selective sweeps, extended haplotypes, similarly limited to sexual populations. They also uh, use recombination as, as the vehicle. So what about cancer? So we have only one way to detect selection uh, or to do gene mapping in a sexual system, and this is recurrence. So we look at individual gene or individual regulatory region, individual functional element identified by, by ENCODE, um, and we're looking at different samples from different patients and we're saying, oh, I see significantly mutated gene, significantly mutated regulatory element because I see many mutations more than I expect by chance in this, in this region. So the problem with this, it's, it's a great idea, of course, right, but there is one fundamental problem this signature of selection is completely confounded by mutation rate variation, right? There is no statistical way out. I may wonder whether this gene is a cancer driver gene or this gene is a mutational hotspot in the specific, specific variants I detect in, in, in patients uh, happen to mutate more frequently than chance by some other reason than selection. Um, there is no way for me to statistically discriminate between the two, right? So I have to model mutation rate. There is no way out. Uh, the problem is that non-functional regions, because one idea is I would look at mutations happening in non-functional regions, so neutral regions, uh, and I will use them as a control to build a model and apply this model to this functional side. So I would contrast something functional and something non-functional. Uh, so 
this idea would be great. Uh, however, if my mutation rate variation is correlated with functionality, however I define it, right, this would not work. Because again, mutation rate variation would completely confound my, my inference. Another idea is, oh, I can tell, take very large number of samples, and then I would look at specific subset of samples or specific patient, and I would observe that these mutations, uh, again, don't conform to null model that I learned on, on other patients. So this idea would not work well in, if mutation rate variation is sample specific, right? So I'd like to argue that both of these are present, and and this poses fundamental problem for statistical methods. Again, I don't want, I study mutations, right? I don't want to explain that this is an important thing. I don't want to be very pessimistic. We're all in the same boat. We have to deal with that. Uh, but fundamentally, we have to f uh, think very carefully about mutation rate variation and, um, if we want to do cancer genomics. Now, all of this is exacerbated uh, in the search for non-coding drivers. With a Peacock project with more and more cancer genomes rather than exomes uh, coming, um, coming out and the field is posed to, uh, to analyze them. We just heard two excellent talks about non-coding drivers. Uh, in my lab, we're fundamentally interested in those. Uh, but because we find this uh, putative fragmentary regions by signatures of chromatin, by epigenetic variables, if those also change mutational processes, right? Our search is completely confounded by this effect. So this is what I'd like to discuss. And again, I don't want to sound very pessimistic, but I think the problem is statistically complicated. Uh, and um, I would go through data that, uh, that support that. Okay, so uh, our first work with ENCODE data, I believe six or seven years back uh, in collaboration with John Stamp, was finding the correlation between replication timing and mutation density, first in germline. And then um, in collaboration with uh, Eric Lander and Gary Getz, we observed the same effect in, in cancer data. Uh, so late in replication, there are more mutations than early in replication. And there are several biological models. Uh, I don't have time really to go through biology because I don't think we, we settled the argument on that. Uh, but this observation uh, is fairly ubiquitous. So in Across cancer types, across data sets, people observe the same, uh, the same effect. Uh, another effect is uh, correlation with uh, expression level. Uh, and Mike Snyder just mentioned uh, both of those effects. Um, so we believe we know the culprit. We think that this effect is uh, mediated by the activity of transcription coupled repair. Again, we don't, we're not, don't know for sure, but this is uh, the most likely uh, the most likely effect. Um, just to remind you about the biology of this, uh, nucleotide excision repair is the pathway that uh, brings this helicase to uh, TF2H towards the lesion, unwinds DNA, it, there is excision step, and there is resynthesis and ligation step. Uh, now the key question here is how is the lesion identified? And there are two different ways the lesion is identified. One is stalled polymerase, right? Transcription goes on, polymerase stumbles on the lesion, cannot proceed forward. And what it does, it recruits this downstream pathway. What it means, it means that the repair, and this is a uh, highly efficient repair pathway, uh, is being brought uh, at the time of, uh, to the lesion at the time of transcription. So more transcription, more repair, less mutations. Uh, the other uh, pathway is global genome repair where um, XPC complex just scans DNA randomly. Okay, so uh, transcription, replication, we'll look at chromatin and again uh, we can find at one megabase scale we and others um, <coughs> dependency on mutation density in cancers on uh, chromatin accessibility, right? And this is DNA's data. Uh, here shown for, uh, for melanoma. Uh, a couple interesting points here. One is uh, the effect is not limited to uh, DNA's hypersensitivity. Uh, we don't know the causality, right? We don't know which specific biological factor drives it, but the general observation is all um, <coughs> activating marks, so marks of uh, active chromatin, active genome, anti-correlate with mutation density. 
uh, and repressive marks positively correlate with, uh, with mutation density, right? So what's happening is uh, every place uh, of the genome, cancer needs highly expressed genes, active regions of early replication, uh, regions of uh, active regulation and transcription, and uh, as I'll mention in a second, uh, regulatory elements, mutation density is reduced. So this is the basic observation. Uh, now, what I mentioned, this is work from last year. I think I already mentioned this uh, at this meeting. Uh, if you combine all of this marks collectively, uh, we can explain very large proportion of variability of mutation rate, uh, the megabase scale. Uh, in some cases, more than 80% of, uh, of variation can be explained by a uh, random forest model, and this is true cross-validation, no, uh, not out of bucket. Uh, and the signal primarily comes from marks of relevant cell type of origin or, or relevant tissue, and in this case, melanoma signal is dominated by uh, elements uh, in melanocytes. But this is epigenome roadmap data. Okay, so this is what's happening uh, at the megabase level. And I would like to mention about a story from a couple years back. Um, we looked also at specific regulatory elements. Uh, at DNA's hypersensitive uh, elements, which we believe most of them are involved in regulation. And what we found that time, um, uh, <clears throat> that in every single sample we analyzed, uh, density of mutations within DNA's hypersensitive site was lower than density of mutations outside, even in the flanking region, right? And um, this is per, per sample, uh, so it depends on number of individual um, tumor genomes in, in the sample, so it's not proportional to number of mutations. Uh, but again, we have multiple myeloma, colon cancer, melanoma, and so forth. And at that point, the hypothesis we came up with is that global genome arm, maybe also transcription coupled uh, repair arm because uh, some of the enhancers are known to be transcribed, uh, but definitely global genome arm is much more efficient in the absence of chromatin, right? So access to DNA is facilitated for, for, that, uh, for that complex and recruitment of the downstream nucleotide excision repair is, is, is more efficient. And we use genetic evidence by splitting melanoma genomes into those that are deficient in nucleotide excision repair uh, and those where nucleotide excision repair is seemingly intact. Uh, and we saw that there is enrichment of nucleotide <coughs> excision repair samples, uh, nucleotide excision repair deficient samples uh, among samples where the effect is absent or very weak. So now, recently, uh, there was a cell paper on experimental work, um, and these two papers, uh, I think, are amazing. Um, what they show is that the effect is indeed mediated by nucleotide excision repair. They use exoseq approach. And what is more interesting and important for the story is that they identified that uh, even though in distal enhancers, the mutation density is lower due to activity of uh, nucleotide excision repair, at active transcription factor binding sites, at the sites where transcription factor is bound tightly, access um, uh, to, to repair is limited, and many of them form uh, mutational hotspots, right? And this is specifically in uh, melanoma, where uh, nucleotide excision repair is very active repairing UV lesions, and in cancers uh, associated with smoking, for example, right? So this is, and again, I'm not saying that all hypermutable regulatory regions um, are false positives, but what's happening here is that you, you find an active transcription factor binding site within DNA's hypersensitive region, and you see that this is a mutational hotspot compared to flanks, and this is purely explained by repair activity rather than by this uh, particular binding site being cancer driver or this uh, nucleotide changes being important for cancer development. Right? So there is this correlation between functional activity and mutation rate, which, which creates statistical problem. Okay, uh, so moving on to, to newer work, uh, what we see again, overall mutation density is low in early replicating region, active regulatory elements, and highly expressed genes. However, this is an aggregate. So what if we look at individual mutagens? at individual mechanisms. And how about individual samples? So 
if I look at individual cancer genome, is the signature present, is it stable, or we have a lot of variation among individual samples, right? And we selected an, an example, which is very well understood, um, and uh, can be statistically detected, and this example is upper back. So I don't know how many people in the audience are familiar with upper back mutagenesis. This is an exciting story. Some are, most aren't, so I'll, I'll go through this real quick. So usually when we think about cancer mutagenesis, we think about exogenous factors. Smoking, UV, uh, certain uh, carcinogens, and stuff like that, right? Upper back is our own human protein. It's actually a family of proteins. Primary, uh, it looks like primary player is upper back uh, 3A. So those are sedin deaminases, uh, and upper back stands for upper B editing coenzyme. It was identified as uh, RNA editing gene, but it's involved in DNA editing, and uh, the hypothesis is that the, the uh, functional role is innate immunity. So single strand DNA is being mutated. The problem is it mutates our own single strand DNA, and this our own, this family of our own proteins play important role in cancer mutagenesis. Why can we identify its signature? Because in experimental system and in cancer genomes, Apobec creates strand coordinated mutation clusters because it acts on single strand DNA. And if I see a strand coordinated cluster, I know that probably they are produced by Apobec, and it also has a uh, characteristic signature, which is not with, without a lot of information content, but better than say UV mutation signature or other mutation signatures. Um, so if I say cluster of this type of changes uh, that are strand coordinated, I ha have a rational hypothesis that uh, upper back is in play. This signature was shown by work of uh, Mike Stratton group, Dmitry Gardenin group, and others to be um, uh, correlated with um, uh, expression levels and there is an association with GWAS signals for uh, in, in upper back for uh, presence of this signature in tumors. So uh, I think we have pretty good amount of evidence that upper back is a player. Now, if I look at enrichment of upper back, uh, right, uh, it varies by cancer type. Some cancers, especially those that um, <coughs> are associated with viruses, I have a lot of um, enrichment and others have uh, almost none. Breast and lung cancers have um, a sizable enrichment of clusters, but also it varies by sample within cancer type. So for some reason in some patients, Apobec is expressed at higher levels and is active, and in other patients it's not. And I, I really don't know what underlies this observation, but there is huge heterogeneity among samples as soon as you stratify cancer genomes in terms of the enrichment of of clusters and enrichment of um, upper back signatures. Uh, so upper back activity results in sample specific mutation properties. Now this is an example, you may think about many other things, right? As soon as you have signature of mutation associated with specific repair mechanism, and this repair mechanism can be compromised in, in subset of patients, uh, you have the same story, right? So this is a story about mutagen, uh, in many cases uh, changes in uh, polymerase uh, delta, polymerase epsilon, changes in repair uh, enzymes can, um, <coughs> can generate sample-specific mutation processes, so making um, use of some patients as controls for, for others very, uh, very difficult in cancer genomics. So what we see in, uh, in, in upper back samples, first we see absolutely inverse relationship with replica replication timing and uh, chromatin accessibility, specifically for strand coordinated clusters um, <coughs> with upper back signature. And this is in lung cancer, and the same signature is observed in, in breast cancer data. Uh, however, probably minority of upper back uh, mutations happen in clusters. Many of them happen individually. So for that, we did the following analysis. So we can look at dependency on DNA replication time of upper back signature mutation uh, versus other mutations. And what we see is that larger is upper back signature, smaller is the slope, and it's actually negative for samples with uh, very high density of upper back mutations, right? So it looks like 
whether you're positively correlated or negatively correlated for specific mutation time with replication timing depends on the mutagen. Uh, and there are some biological stories why, because upper back needs source of single strand DNA, why, why it would be biased towards early replication. Uh, being a little uh, more sophisticated, uh, we came up with a mixture model where we're saying that some mutations in upper back uh, signature are generated by upper back activities, uh, others by other uh, mutagens, or just spontaneous uh, mutations, and we know the enrichment, which we can estimate separately as a parameter, so we can feed this model to the data. And what we see here, again, if I look at replication timing versus upper back signature mutation enrichment, I see that uh, for, uh, <coughs> uh, for uh, samples with low enrichment, I have very strong dependency on replication timing and much weaker dependency with, uh, with low enrichment. And uh, as, as I just said, in samples with very, low enri uh, so with very high enrichment, uh, it actually becomes a uh, negative slope. So conclusions of this story is um, the effects of epigenomic feature and cancer mutation may be mutagen dependent, right? So the idea would we just regress out replication timing uh, or expression may not be sufficient in, in many of the analysis because it really depends on what is underlying mutational process for this particular sample. Uh, Apovec mutations, for example, are unique in genomic distribution and it looks like mutation model have to be sample specific, right? So this is all a um, set of sort of pessimistic notes but as I said, we're in the same boat with everybody else, so we have to find encoding drivers, right? Uh, we know it's very difficult. We have to try. Ooh, now I have to run. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll try to talk ver uh, uh, <coughs> very fast. So uh, this work is in collaboration with uh, Kelly Fraser, lab in San Diego, uh, with Matteo D'Antonio. Uh, so what we, what we try to do is we try to cluster regulatory elements uh, marked by DNA's one hypersensitivity by all covariates we could come up with uh, in as homogeneous a uh, set of breast cancer samples as we could. We assume Poisson statistics uh, within clusters and we use non-matching tissue types as a control to derive FDR. Now, there is a good news and a bad news. The good news is that Kelly found, Kelly's lab found a lot of corroborating evidence and experimental work to suggest that there is signal in the data. The bad news, as a statistician, what I wanted to see, I wanted to see that my data, my some sort of control data are exactly Poisson distributed because this would mean that I explained every single covariate and I know, I know the behavior of the data. And we never achieved that, right? It's always inflated. We, we never, in this approach, we've never seen a clean and nice Poisson distribution. Now saying that, um, if we look at random controls and not matching uh, types and we look at p-value enrichment specifically for breast cancer DHSs and breast cancer samples, we obviously have enrichment uh, in, uh, in number of different data sets. For example, if we look at aberrantly expressed genes, significantly mutated regions are enriched and then we looked at uh, <coughs> independent data sets uh, and ended up with 16 elements that seem to provide, um, where evidence seems to be um, sufficiently solid. However, this is nagging, right? So I cannot come up with statistical models, uh, accurate statistical models with uh, as many covariates as, um, uh, as I tried to use. So we decided using last 30 seconds, I'll try to walk you through ongoing work where uh, what we're trying to do is we decided to give up on estimating local mutation rate as a point estimator. It's just very difficult, and you're looking at hyper significantly mutated region, and if your model is very little wrong, right, you're, you're still riding on the tail of the distribution, and your gene rate falls positive. So we decided to, uh, and we have to model set of samples uh, in hand, rather than the, the general process. Uh, so we opt for a hierarchical model. So this is the, the idea. We take all data across genomes, we fit parametric model for mutation heterogeneity overall, so hyperparameters. Took us two years to find very good parametric solution for that. Uh, then we take known covariates, which is still good information, and sometimes neutral density in the locus, so if we think we have some reasonable proxy to neutral mutations, but we don't believe any of this, as much as we don't believe that, uh, but we can use this to generate posteriors for the set of functional sites. Right? So it's not like I'm saying that I have exact model and this is my p-value. 
right? This is a much more flexible approach. Uh, of course, the only way to test it right now is to look at coding uh, variation. So the way it looks uh, uh, for different cancer types, for example, this is lying adenic carcinoma. We fit synonymous sites. So this uh, model has several parameters. Uh, we fit synonymous sites, and then we just recompute the target. So non-synonymous, missions and nonsense mutations, this is zero parameter fit. Right? We basically just take the synonymous model and scale it up. Uh, and as you see, it fits pretty well. However, there is some signature of possibly negative selection and possibly, possibly positive selection. So I don't have time to uh, go through all fits for different cancer type, but the basic result is that if we use the model and look at our ability to find known cancer genes against MUTSEC, uh, we usually generate greater AUC. And what was our interest is finding negative selection if we look at cell es essential genes according to CRISPR screen, and most of the signal is driven by obvious things like ribosomal proteins and so forth, we also find uh, evidence for negative selection in the same model, right? And this again goes uh, across uh, several cancer types um, where we see both increase in AUC for positive selection and some, e e uh, <coughs> however, weak signal for, uh, for negative selection. Uh, so, uh, the whole story is that understanding mutation rate heterogeneity helps understand basic biology, but also develop methods for cancer genomics. That mutation rate varies by cancer type and, and by sample. Epigenomic features are key to understand it, and we obviously need better statistical approaches because there is a lot of confounding between uh, functional encode features we use to, to assign function and the same functional encode features uh, influencing mutation rate. And that's, that's the major com com uh, complexity in the field. Uh, thanks to my lab, we're very careful thinking about our projects. Um, most of the work uh, is done by Paz Pollack, who now left the lab, uh, and uh, Donata Beckhorn, who is a uh, current postdoc, and of course John and Bob, Rosa Karlich and Adon Karan, Dmitry, Marat and Steve on Upper Beck project, and uh, Kelly Fraser and Matteo D'Antonio, I decided to include non-coding drivers at the last minute, so they should be on the slide. Yeah, that was a great talk. Uh, I have a question about the uh, essential genes. I didn't get that quite clearly. So most of the genes actually don't show mutations in cancer samples. So that's a very hard problem to identify the ones that are less than expected because most don't show mutation. How, how were you getting that? Right, so, so the, the, the story is, is, is this. So we were interested in identifying negative selection in cancers for a long time. The signal is amazingly weak. Uh, then what happens is um, uh, that similar method when, again, you ex ex uh, is, uh, ex uh, estimate mut local mutation rate and look at the deficit has very low power. So apparently hierarchical model has, has more power uh, and still quantifying is very difficult. But what is done here, we're showing a UC for collective group of genes that show um, the effect in the CRISPR screen. Right, so those are functionally significant genes. And again, I cannot beat Benferroni. I cannot give you the new non-oncogenic addiction gene, which is a great um, target for, for therapeutic uh, intervention. But for the first time, we, sh we see significant change for group of gene. Right? So it's a combination of, uh, I think, greater power of the statistic uh, and the ability to have a control data set. It seems, I, I, I know why you threw out the local context correction, <clears throat> but it seems like in the cancers where there are lots of mutations, you could actually bring that in. You know, some, some of the cancers have 100,000 or more, or some of the esophageal and things like that. So you actually could do, there's enough data, I think you could probably get meaningful correction. Is, have you, oh, ha, have you considered that or? Yeah, correction, right, so, so um, I, I, this is what, what I did sweep under the rug. So I think what you're asking is context-specific mutation correction. Yeah. Right, so this is done, this is, at this model, this is done by sample or by concert type, we tried both. I expected originally to have huge boost out of doing it 
by sample. Of course, you, you're working with less data. We didn't see a huge boost. Uh, so far, uh, it's working. Uh, but the improvement is not up to the point that uh, it, it's, it's night and day. Um, the, the problem what I see here is that regional covariates also are sample specific. And those are much more difficult to deal with, right? So this is why um, our idea at the moment is you try to find signature of selection on the sample of genomes. The nice thing about sample of genomes is that if you get your estimated mutation rate right, or the distribution randomized right, locally it's possible. So if I sum across sample, it's still possible. So I can model of, of randomized I can model randomized Poisson for this specific sample rather than for cancer type or, or, or individual individual genome, right? And this solves a bunch of problems. I think we cut power with the, with this approach, but we definitely cut down some false positives. One more. Uh, quick question with regards to you, so you point out the need for taking into account the chromatin state, epigenetic state to effectively take into account the rate of mutations. Could you bypass that or improve on that by simply expanding the size of the nucleotide looked at for defining signatures of mutations? Right, because right now we're restricting to three nucleotides, which doesn't really relate to the biology that's specific to what goes on in regulatory <laughs> elements, for instance. Right, uh, so, so there are two different stories, right? One is, again, context specificity. So association of mutation rate with chromatin, I believe, is not context, only context specificity phenomenon. It's not only driven by sequence features. Because, and you can obviously find it uh, by looking at different genomes and different uh, cells where DNA's hypersensitivity was measured. So we'll look, for example, at breast-specific elements versus liver genome and liver-specific elements versus breast, uh, breast genome. Uh, and it is clear that activity of the element actually openness of chromatin or tightly tight binding by transcription factors, this is what drives a lot of this, right? Some of this is indeed driven by, by the context. Uh, there, there is a very recent paper in Nature Genetics by, by Ben Voigt uh, suggesting in germline data that 7-mer outperforms um, just neighboring nucleotides. I think it's, it's a convincing paper. Of course, the only reason they could uh, have enough power is that they don't use it at de novo mutations, they don't use it at cancer data, they use it at population sequencing. Uh, whether this extends to cancer data sets and whether uh, extending the model to, to larger context would improve the signal, I don't know. We never tried. And we never tried because of data sparsity. You just can't, can't learn the model. I was wondering, <clears throat> how do you choose what your wrong tissue type is? And has that, how much of an effect does that have? Uh, how do we choose what, sorry? Like your wrong tissue type? You're right, so this is, um, again, this is, this is the complicated part, and this is why I believe our models, like the simple models, not the hierarchical models, don't fully work. Um, so you can take uh, DNA's data, and you can say, okay, so I have, for example, breast cancer and I have liver cancer. And we looked at a whole bunch, I'm just giving you um, two for, uh, as, as, an, as an example. So I can have the following set of DNA peaks, right? shared, specific to breast, not in liver, specific to liver, not in breast. Uh, and I can look at all these three um, separately, and I can see how my signatures, my mutational model changes. So this is what we've done. Now, the caveat here, of course, uh, is that it should take into account uh, sequence features. It should take into account some general features. If the activity of the element is driving mutational process, we cannot take this into account. The other uh, consideration, and what, what Kelly noted to me, um, say there is liver cancer element, which is not active in breast tissue. How do you know in some breast cancer samples this element is not open, uh, is, is, is not working? I, I don't, right? So at this point, I give up and move to modeling overall distribution parametrically rather than thinking about what's happening in specific element, because I, I just don't think this is doable at, uh, at this point in time. Great, thanks. Uh, I have a question, and um, I'm not from cancer genetics, so, uh, but it seems to me that within cancer, the mutation rate would be heterogene heterogeneous between the cells of ours and much more homogeneous within the um, normal tissue. Am I correct? So, 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 uh, sorry, I'm not sure I... Uh, the 
-hmm. cancer cells are all in different stages of differentiation or right. mutation and so on, and therefore the mutation rate in each cell and the mutation potential in each of those cells would be different. Right, that's, that's an excellent question. So, so uh, first of all, we do not look at heterogeneity for now. So we don't have single cell resolution polymorphism data in, uh, in, 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 in tumor. I'd love to have this data. Uh, I, I think I'm not early adopters of new technology data sets, so I, we, we think we should wait a little bit. Now, what we see are mutations that e are either fixed or reach very high frequency in, uh, in tumors. We think most of them are early. Uh, and again, we're thinking about modeling the sample, not, not the individual progression. Now, I was Im extremely interested in the model where mutation rate evolves with the progression from uh, uh, due to stages. The reason I was interested because of our interest in evolution of mutation rate, because you can imagine that secondary selection, selection on mutation rate, may be much more uh, efficient than selection on any individual deleterious change. Uh, I don't think we, we saw evidence of that. Uh, so we looked into this. Uh, I think I presented this last year at this meeting. I, I don't think there is sufficient evidence to corroborate the model. Again, th theoretically, that's a beautiful model, but I, I, I'm just not sure we see, we see the evidence in the data of that, of that type of heterogeneity. Uh, 